Uh, with that, I'll turn over to Rick. Rick's going to tell you all about the dark matter result. Dan, thanks. So if the members of Lux who are here and those who are on the video take a, take a bow, I hope you're all enjoying this as much as we are. <laughs> the, the, these guys have worked incredibly hard to get to this point. I think they're going to take a moment's breather, and I hope they get to enjoy the results that we're all about to see right now. So, Lux. Lux is the quietest place verified in the world. That's how far we've had to go in order to be in a position to look for these wimps. We've done this um, even better than we expected. Now, just to give you some idea, this is a color plot where this scale is logarithmic, which means factors of 10, and it's in the canonical unit we use for measuring radioactive backgrounds. This is the dimension of the detector. This is the radius, or actually the radius squared. Those of you that you get this, this is just the height. And as you transition from red to blue, the detector is getting quieter and quieter and quieter inside. It self-shields, as Dan described. And the number that we've achieved, this, this milli DRU, three milli DRU, is absolutely fantastic. And in fact, it's getting better. Because we were in such an unholy rush to get the detector underground, the xenon was still on the surface back in January. And everything, you, me, and the xenon are being exposed to all these cosmic rays, we get activated. That activation is going away. So this detector is getting better and better right now. It's getting quieter and quieter in the middle. And you'll see in a moment, or well, a few moments, how important that is. So this example I'm about to give is correct in an order of magnitude sense. We really can think that um, when we ran Lux on the surface, which we did uh, for a year and a half here at Sanford Lab in a facility that was built by the lab for the purpose and was one of the reasons why things have been so rapid in the uh, development and how so successful. Let's imagine we're standing in the middle, on the field, in the middle of a Super Bowl. We've filled it to capacity, 75,000 of us, and we're all clapping hard for our team. That was what it was like when we ran this enormous Lux detector on the surface. The insane quantities of energy, frankly, were being, certainly in particle physics terms, were being deposited by all of these cosmic rays. Sanford Lab is really important because we have to escape those, those rays. And what happens is we take the detector underground, it becomes like listening to one person now in the stand, clapping about once a minute. That's how much we benefit from both going deep underground and also being in this 76,000-gallon water tank, high-purity water tank that the lab, Sanford Lab, also provided. Now, the WIMPs, the WIMPs are even lower energy than a clap. They're actually just like somebody taking an occasional breath in the field. And that's, that's what we're after. We want to see if we can hear that occasional breath. So here we are. We're in Sanford Lab. We're well past this 4,000 meter water equivalent. This is just a way of measuring the effective shielding that all this rock puts between us and outer space. This is absolutely key that we are in such a deep lab. It allows us to do very precise work, knowing or be comfortably knowing that we are not having to deal with the issues associated with these cosmic, cosmic rays. This is what the background in Lux looks like at high energies. These peaks are associated with various radioactive isotopes. Some of them are ones we're all very familiar with, uranium and thorium, which are simply natural radioactivity and exist in all of us. In fact, in a typical human body right now, there are probably 2,000 or so decays per second occurring in uranium, thorium, and potassium, probably not cobalt unless you're carrying a gamma hip or something. But um, we also have the xenon, the xenon 127, is shown here, that's a cosmogenically produced xenon. It decays, it radioactively decays, so under, once you get underground, that starts uh, disappearing. What gets us really excited about is that in the space of just a few months, we have developed a model, as you see, this is the red line, that completely describes this. This is really important when you're doing rare event searches to be able to describe in a simulation what you're seeing in reality allows you to take your understanding to a whole new level and allows to, you to really improve your confidence in the data. 
So this is a very technical slide, but I wanted to put it up anyway, really because it's such an impressive piece of work. We have established that in the LUX detector, the overall sort of uh, radioactivity breaks down as following. The vast majority of events come from just gamma rays from uh, these internal components, just residual. We've worked very hard to bring the radioactive levels down, but there's still a little bit of radioactivity left. So in units of 10 to the minus 3 events per keV per kilogram per day, and this is the radioactive levels at low, at very low energies in the middle 118 kilograms of the detector, we find we have about 1.8 milli DRU, as we, we often call it. This cosmogenic component, which is dying away with a half-life of about 36 days, uh, on average during the WIMP search, contributed about a 0.5 uh, into that, but this is going away, so that's tremendous. We do find a little bit of our friend Radon 222. We're all breathing it right now. Take a deep breath. You've just sucked in enough Radon to expose you to, uh, I mean, tens or 20 decays in your lungs before you breathe out again. It's, I, there's nothing you can do about it. It's perfectly, you're perfectly harmless. To us, it's a pain, uh, but we have really hammered this level down. We'd see a tiny bit of it left. It's always, this is always one of the great fears in an experiment like this, that effectively you open a window or open a pipe and the radon gets in. But we've done a tremendous job of keeping that out. And lastly, as Dan already mentioned, the, this Krypton-85 isotope that's naturally, uh, well, it actually pops out of reactors, but uh, it, 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 when you get your xenon delivered, they deliver it with about 130 parts per billion. We've been able to re reduce that level to three and a half parts per trillion. And as you'll see in a moment, that's absolutely <laughs> crucial as well to getting data. And we have good agreement between what our predicted level of background is and what the observed level of background is, which as physicists is enormously important. This over quite a broad energy range is just designed to give you an idea of how it goes. This is definitely a nerd plot, um, uh, but I, uh, you know, it, it, it is fascinating. And again, the key thing is that all of these various backgrounds are extremely well understood already. We've only been running this detector for uh, uh, you know, nine months. I wanted to point out one particular background because you're going to see it raise its head just a little bit at the end. This is this cosmogenic 127 xenon. What we have here is a plot with this standard discrimination parameter, the ratio of S2 over S1, the secondary the ionization signal over the primary uh, signal. But this is an interesting case. This is xenon 127 cosmogenically created undergoing what's called electron capture. The nucleus literally reaches out, grabs an electron out of the atomic shell in order to decay, in order to turn from xenon into iodine. What's interesting is if that gamma that comes from the subsequent de-excitation of the excited iodine leaves the building, leaves the detector, all you have left is a single hole in your atomic shell, and that atomic shell uh, refills itself, and you see an electron or an OJ, uh, sorry, you see an X-ray or an OJ electron uh, produced. This is a fascinating because it's allowing us to study in this, in this 250 kilogram, quarter of a ton, we are looking at energies 5, 1, even getting a hint of 0.2 keV, which again, to anybody who gets it, this is extraordinary science to do it in, 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 in such a large volume. I mean, when I was a graduate student, you know, this is the sort of thing that got us excited, but we were doing it in milligram bolometers. We, we, you know, fraction of a gram bolometers, and that would get us excited. We're doing this in a quarter of a ton. This is, this is tremendous. So let's talk about the WIMP search run. It took place from April 21st to August 8th. I don't know how you guys spent your summer, but this is how we spent our summer. It's about 110 calendar days. From that, you'll hear this term live days. This is the sort of number that, of actual sort of live exposure that you can count searching for WIMPs. And the reason there's a difference between these numbers is because we spent a fair amount of time calibrating the detector. Because if you're going to claim discovery of a WIMP signal, you have to be damn sure that you're not just simply measuring some kind of background that you just failed to understand adequately. So, as Dan described, we frequently injected Krypton-83. This is different from the Krypton that we described earlier, that was Krypton-85. This is a short-lived, you know, one and a half hour isotope, A3M, that allows us to get this fantastic level of calibration. This is a new technique and has worked incredibly well. We have taken neutron sources, both Amaris and Beryllium and Californium. We have calibrated the detector. We've also simulated the detector in fantastic detail. The, uh, and 
This has allowed us to understand in, in great detail the nuclear recoil response, the NR response. Why do we care about that? Because WIMPs, if they're going to interact with our detector, they are going to bounce off that nucleus in the same way that a neutron does. Now, a neutron, when it bounces around either in you and I or in our detector, actually has a mean free path of about 11 centimeters. So, in fact, when neutrons get in, they tend to multiply scatter, which makes the process of calibrating with these sources a little bit entertaining. But nonetheless, our simulations are so good and our ability to analyze the data with all this position resolution is so good that we have got a very good standard for where we think WIMP signals should be appearing uh, in terms of the parameters that we use to measure events in our detector. And then lastly, we have this tritiated methane, which allows us at very high statistics to completely calibrate the electron recoil response in the middle of the detector down to energies below 1 kV EE. That has not been done before, and because we've done it, we can be so much more confident about the result we're going to discuss in terms of you know, the WIMP signal. We've also spent a lot of time on making sure we completely understand the efficiency of the detector. I remember when we did the CDMS, uh, I was on the CDMS experiment many years ago on Slashdot. Somebody posted just after we quoted a result where we didn't see anything. It said, well, obviously the detector's not sensitive to it. The idea that we would spend you know, two years of our life building a detector that wasn't sensitive to the thing we were looking for obviously is, is, is a little ridiculous, should we say. Um, I can tell you, we have worried ourselves uh, you know, into, into ecstasy, frankly, <laughs> over this point. We wanted to know whether we really are as efficient and whether we have a coherent story. And again, it's extraordinary. When we nine months in and we have a completely coherent picture of how the efficiency of our detector works, which is, which is, which is again, enormously important for any claim we're likely to make. Now, there's another sort of mantra that I, sort of guided me over the years, which is clearly the sensitivity of a dark matter experiment scales as its mass. This is a very rare particle. The bigger you can make your damn detector, the, the more events you're going to be able to see. Or equally, if the, if, if, if the particle is proving fairly ethereal, because uh, this cross-section gets smaller and smaller, then you just need to go big in order to uh, end up having enough uh, nuclei for these things to occasionally interact with. The challenge is the problems clearly scale as the surface area of any detector. Surfaces are horrible. You don't understand them. They are difficult to model. They're difficult to calibrate. They do screwy things. I've spent more than uh, uh, nights on previous experiments in serious trouble over what had happened to our dark matter search because we frankly misunderstood the way radioactivity interacts with uh, the surface of our detector. Lux doesn't really have a surface. Lux has a sort of virtual surface in the sense that what we're going to be talking about is whether there are any events inside this volume of 118 kilograms that's sitting inside uh, and completely connected with a, a larger 250 volume of xenon. I mean, there's no wall there. It's, it's all the same volume. We use this wonderful position resolution in order to define this virtual space inside. And as I've already shown you, it's incredibly quiet in there. So. What that's allowed us to do is to, again, really remove a lot of the systematics that traditionally plague dark matter experiments and lead to people rushing down the corridor and often rushing out to the press and saying, hey, we found wimps. Where instead what you're doing, and this is, I mean, look, I, 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 I've had this problem, uh, what you're doing is just understanding in excruciating detail how screwed up, well, sorry, I shouldn't say that, sorry. Somebody's supposed to be stopping me from doing this. So, so how messed up the, the um, Sorry, Tourette's going. No, um, anyway, right, look. So, modeling. It's, it's just, this is a very simple detector. It's huge, but it's simple. It's, it's, it's a monolithic, if you like, xenon volume. That's enormously important for anything. Now, in, the, in this game, in, in, you know, in the business of science uh, or particle physics, there's a technique called blinding, which is, is what you do to data to stop the really smart people that work on the program from manufacturing the result that somehow you've indicated you want. Because the, the whole point is you have to employ clever people because there's no point in doing the experiment. Clever people are damn good at not only creating exactly the signal you kind of indicated to them that you wanted, but also um, at covering their tracks. <laughs> we, we, we've, we've seen that in Wall Street, I think. Um, so, so, uh, we, but this particular analysis is not blind. And we, 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 we say that up front. But having said that, it might be not blind, but it's, bl it's, sorry, it's very simple. It's very simple. And therefore, actually, the reason why you typically blind an experiment 
uh, in modern physics, like the LHC analysis and things like that, is because frankly there are so many cuts that are being applied to the data that you've got to somehow handle that systematic. For this first data result we have here in Lux, you will see that the cut list is so short that it's actually very difficult for the smart guys over there to fiddle the, fiddle the data. So let's, let's, let, let's get on with that. Okay, so cut list very short. There are technical issues, I'm gonna have to pick up the speed a bit. The fiducial volume, what I just wanted to say was that in picking the fiducial volume to those people who are highly technical, we did so using an independent set of uh, backgrounds of leakage events, sorry, of events that are on the walls and the grids of the detector. But we were able to study ones that were not at energies associated with WIMPs and therefore uh, we were not biasing the data when we picked our fiducial volume. We have used a profile likelihood ratio, a profile likelihood analysis, which again, for those of you in the know, will understand that that allows us to take all of this wonderful modeling we've done to really understand the data up at higher energies in terms of the gamma backgrounds or the amount of uh, cosmogenic activation uh, and so forth. And we, we put all of that into the model and that predicts these probability distributions for where particles should and should not be. And we then have a hypothesis for the WIMP, which varies depending on what the WIMP's mass is or cross section. And we put that in as well and you just see how consistent your data is with that um, uh, particular hypothesis. And you then do that hundreds of thousands of times over and over again inside the mind of the machine in order to study statistically how significant the vet your result against these various hypotheses. Now, I know this might sound uh, like you know, smoke and mirrors or magic. It's not, it really is. Physicists really enjoy this stuff. And it is a, we've developed techniques that make this pretty robust. So I know all the sayings about statistics and what have you, but uh, honestly, when it comes to analyzing data like this, it allows us to talk in, a, in, in terms that I think we can all understand. Sorry, maybe. Okay, um, so uh, uh, key point there, it avoids, again, biasing in the, in the S1, S2 signal space, which is a sort of technical uh, point. So, um, yeah, I should move, move forward. So this is what the data looks like. We took 84 million triggers uh, over the summer. Uh, you know, fantastic effort. We um, uh, obviously working closely with the lab to keep the detector stable. So, uh, you know, Sanford lab, everything worked well. We, when we cut out the periods when the detector sort of did anything uh, we, we didn't particularly want, that was less than 1% of the time. Uh, so we just knocked a few, we, we knocked a few of those, uh, you know, uh, 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 events out, just, just a thing. What we then do is, look, WIMPs are only going to scatter once in your detector. So one of the really great cuts you can make in your data is just simply to identify where you have single scatter events, localized, single point, there's no sign of additional uh, vertices, uh, you know, de energy depositions in the detector. So we do that. We then go ahead, well, look, WIMPs interact at low energies. So let's focus in on this low energy uh, regime. We're using a 2 to 30 photoelectron uh, S1 in that, which corresponds to roughly these uh, energy ranges here. And the key thing we're bragging about here is look at that, 3 kVnR. That, that, that for the, again, for those in the know, boy, that's going to be a surprise to a lot of people, I think. That's a very low energy. We do make a cut in S2 as well, but we're, so uh, that's not so much for energy, that's just to uh, sort of make the data consistent in terms of uh, the events we're doing. So we're now down to only 20,000 events after the 84. Now, we do find that periodically the detector gets a little overexcited. It spends most of its time in a wonderfully quiescent state, but occasionally when you put quite a lot of energy through it, occasional mu on that sort of thing, big, big S2, it's so sensitive that it actually, for, you know, it, it, it continues to reverberate a little bit due to single electrons that have been generated in the xenon, and they continue to burp out of the detector, and they do so on timescales of sort of millisecond or so. So we do put in a cut to sort of identify the quiet periods in the detector, and the quiet periods are about 99.2% of the time, so only 0.8% of the time do we actually have the thing in, in its slightly unsettled state. So we, we, we make that cut, uh, and we think, think, so we're now, you know, we're at 90,000. What's going to happen now is we are going to fiducialize. We are going to go into that middle 118 kilograms. And what happens is we initially just cut away from the grids, but we do this in two parts. When we get down to the middle of the detector, this is where the magic has really happened. We are now have, throughout, we have run for a period of three months and we only have 160 events left. That's less than two events a day in the region of interest. So, okay, so the question, I, I know some of the theorists are busy calculating right now what this means. But anyway, let's, let's not wait for them to catch up, right? You guys are all ahead of them. <laughs> so, so this is a plot, highly technical, really just designed to convince people that we know what the hell we're doing. What it is, is 
an amber, a neutron calibration. And this, the, the, these points here are data, and these blue, the blue line is is a, a, a very advanced sort of simulation right from uh, the ground up. We actually generate uh, in the mind of the computer uh, actual photons um, and propagate them all the way through the entire analysis chain. And this is what happens on the way out. And as uh, Dan shows you, uh, you're assuming a certain response curve for the um, for the um, for the, uh, uh, you know, the xenon, the way the xenon physics is working as well. But all of this gets rolled in, and we can be very confident about the understanding right down here to two photoelectrons, which is why we can talk with certainty about what's going on at 3 keV NR, because that is about 3 keV uh, uh, nuclear recoil. What we've also done is used various other uh, sets, so that the gray and the red are both extracted from these blue. They're just demonstrating what the efficiency looks like when you normalize here over on the right dropping from 100% down here at the lowest energies, it goes down to 0%. But we've compared this with tritium and get very similar behavior, quite consistent. We've even taken literally the whole experiment into the mind of the computer and done the whole thing uh, ourselves, and we get a very similar result there. And it's actually the most conservative uh, uh, measurement we have, and that's the one we go ahead and use in the subsequent analysis. So this, again, highly technical plot, had to put it up, because I know the theorists are going to love this, and the other experimentalists are going to love this one. But that we've now converted everything into recoil energy, which is how much energy the WIMP would actually be depositing in the experiment. And this is just showing a series of uh, curves, which is what happens as we uh, uh, calculate, or not calculate, measure how good we are at identifying S1 pulses, how good we are at identifying S2 pulses, how good we are identifying the two guys together in a, in, a, in a single scattering event, S1, S2. And then we include all the analysis cuts, which actually, as you saw earlier, are really not very many. Uh, there really aren't, you know, uh, you, what, the sort of traditional uh, ones. And, and this is the efficiency we get, which gives us at about uh, 3 kVNR, we're 17% efficient. For, and this is in this massive volume, the 118 kilos. 4.3 kVNR, 50%. And we're over 95% by the time we get to 7 kV an hour. These are very low energies, and it's enormously important that we're able to run. So what would a signal look like? So these are simulations. This is the S2 over S1, this ionization ratio. This is just the S1 energy. And this is what, if, if we were to discover WIMPs at the currently 90% excluded sensitivity up at very high masses, say, um, uh, from xenon 100, uh, uh, the, their current exclusion, then Lux in this three day data, three, three day, three month data would have seen nine events. That would be a very clear signature, as you'll see. So if we've got this WIMP, this cross section in there, we're, we're going to see it. We're, we're all going to basically know about it. Now, critically, I, I should say that we are using very standard assumptions about the astrophysics that we're putting into our model of, of WIMP uh, signal there. So that thing. What's, even more entertaining is just how many WIMPs you would get if the positive signals, or sorry, the, the, the tentative signals that a number of experiments have talked about in low mass WIMP terms, down at 8.6 times the mass of a proton, this GEV uh, symbol. So CD, CDMS2 silicon, for instance, these numbers take a, if CDMS2 silicon is correct, there are three events that they see in these quite small silicon events, we would have 1,550 events. That means we'd actually get one event every time Sam Ting rode his AMS experiment, which is stationed on the ISS, round the Earth, we'd get another, we'd get another event. AMS is also looking for dark matter. Um, it, one every 80, sec 80 minutes. That's an extraordinarily high event rate. I think we can all agree that that's going to be a difficult one to miss. One of the in other interesting things, a technical point, is you'll see that this distribution has shifted down compared to the nuclear recall line. This is expected behavior and actually significantly improves our ability to look for these low mass WIMPs because up here is where the electron recoil events are and therefore the amount of bleeding, as you were, uh, what do we call it, leakage uh, down into this region uh, is, is, is much reduced. We have tremendous contrast for seeing these WIMPs and if there are 1,550 of them, boy, are we gonna know about it. Okay, so this is it, the WIMP search result. Obviously, it's not quite this good. We, we, there's not, nothing on the plot. This is just the electron recoil band and the nuclear recoil band uh, that we were discussing uh, earlier. So this is where the remaining couple of events a day uh, of that order, the electron recoil background, will be populating, and this is where your WIMPs would populate. Now, as Dan described, there is what we call leakage, which is, this is the 10% to 90%. So outside of the blue region, both above and below, you do expect to see electron recoil events. 
So what you're trying to do is figure out whether the things that are leaking sort of through here, that sort of tend to up here, whether they are from a population that's been generated by nuclear recoils or whether they are just simply leakage events from electron recoil. And that's the kind of statistical analysis we really are going to focus on at this point. Although I, I think visually you're going to uh, you know, get the idea very quickly. And then what we can do is superimpose the energies on this. It turns out that in these scales, energies are not simple. You, you actually have these uh, contours of this type, either uh, we're discussing the energy in KV nuclear recoil here, or for the events up here, we tend to use this unit of KV electron equivalent. There's a good technical reason for that. I can't go into it. The analysis we're doing is between this point here and this point here with this simple cut in the S1. So that's one of the cuts that we've made. And then another cut we're making is that we require the S2 to be greater than about uh, 200 photoelectrons. Now, it turns out that our definition of 200 photoelectrons is actually in what's called the raw uh, 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 um, sum of all of the S2 rather than what's plotted here, which is S2b. So this, this is a slightly, in this parameter space, this is a slightly fuzzier edge. But I, again, we don't need to worry too much about that. All, all to say is we're, we're not looking or accepting WIMPs down here. OK, so that's it. That's the data. We have 160 events in there. It's less than two a day. As I said, that's absolutely unprecedented. This is 118 kilograms run over 85 days. And what we're seeing is a fairly uniform population of electron recoils. We, we, as I'll show you in a minute, we do see a little bit of the features associated with this cosmogenically activated xenon-127. What we see is events outside of this band, and we see events out of this band. And the question is, is there a WIMP signal in there? So this region here, as I say, these events here are coming from the 127 xenon. For the purposes of this analysis, we've actually just picked, or, or, and this is something we did very early on in the analysis, we decided to stay below this 5 kV region just, ju just to reduce any systematic effect associated with these guys. So the question is, is any of this? Now you'll notice, obviously, half of this band is completely empty. So what we, get, what we need to do is to look at these points and decide is there any, in any way or any of those consistent with being anything other than simply the background. At this point, I'm afraid we go statistical on a, on a whoops, nearly so. Um, so p-value. That just simply gives you an idea of what the probability is that this set of points are simply consistent with everything we know about the background in this detector. And it turns out this is a very high consistency, 35% in p-value terms is actually, this tells you as a, as a physicist that it looks like these points, all of these points are all drawn from the same distribution, and that distribution is the one associated with the backgrounds that we've already been able to measure and completely model. Now, you know, um, what we can then do is say to ourselves, well, what are the chances that actually hiding in amongst this rain cloud, or this, you know, these, these few events that are here, you know, maybe one of them is a wimp. Maybe one or two of them is a wimp. So again, statistics is up to this chance. It's called, this is how we derive these limits, these 90% confidence upper limits. And to put it in terms I think we can all understand, then at low masses, and we'll look at that at region in a bit more detail, there are a maximum of 2.4 events. And one of the reasons for that is you have to realize that the wimps are at low masses are supposed to be appearing down here. They're not actually in the middle of this band. They are actually down, you know, down here. The higher mass wimps do align themselves the events more uniformly either side of this band. So we have a very good limit of less than 2.4, sorry, less than 2.4 events, uh, WIMP events in the entire run. And that's, that's a very conservative, what's called 90% confidence upper limit. And then, is that Mike turning my mic off? I'm, I'm so sorry, Mike, I know I'm going over. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. And then, and then he did warn me he was going to take me down. I mean, if, you, if you see him coming towards me and I start moving over here, you, you know why. Um, although I did used to play rugby, so uh, we'll, uh, I was the second row. You'll know how what nasty work pieces of work they are. Um, so, uh, so actually, it was a gentleman's sport back then. I don't know. Um, so. It's, oh, I, I'm not webized apparently. The web feed, audio web feed is in problems, is that, uh, don't know. Okay, sorry. So uh, 2.4 events down here at low energies, 5.3 events, maximum 90% confidence limit up here between 30 and 2. And I, I, you know, those are really conservative ways of characterizing this. The expectation uh, for the number of events here 
uh, you know, for a high mass WIMP, I think it's 2.5 plus or minus 2.5. So you basically don't, you just don't have any, I mean, and the p-value we talked about earlier, the consistency with background, essentially what we call the null hypothesis. You know, you've, you've done all this work, and your experiment is basically consistent with the obvious explanation, which is its, its background. That's known as a null hypothesis. It's enormously important to always understand how your experiment stacks up against the most obvious explanation, because until that number gets very small, you have no business getting out there and claiming discovery. So what about low mass WIMPs? We've just zoomed into the low energy region. And as you saw, there were supposed to be 1,550 of these guys. Down here, uh, yeah, down here actually. Even if you go to lower masses, this detector is still sensitive. So there would be an enormous number of these guys here, and they're just not there. And we've spent a lot of time making damn sure that we uh, know our efficiency. So they're just not there at extremely high confidence. We are just not consistent with the observations that a number of other dark matter experiments have made of apparent uh, events that they were saying were due to low mass dark matter. You know, why can we be so confident? I hope I've sort of made that case why maybe they've been fooled. It's because they have lots of surface area. These are smaller detectors, smaller masses, lots of surface area. It gets very confused and difficult to understand exactly what's going on. And this leads to systematic effects that could possibly be interpreted as dark matter, but could really just be interpreted as not quite knowing your detector well enough. The, the, the xenon is just so simple and monolithic that it's much more difficult to get fooled like this. And it's an important point. After 25 years of looking for this stuff, I can tell you, the, you know, the, trying to find the sort of I, platonic ideal of a detector, one in which it doesn't give you all this um, uh, issues when you're trying to understand it associated with surfaces, is an enormous uh, thing. So Dan mentioned the statistics here. If we often talk in terms of leakage. This is the lower, the bottom half of the nuclear recoil region. The prediction is that we should have about 0.64 events in this region based on the discrimination number that Dan quoted. And this chap is just over the line. Although, as it turns out, this leakage number is actually not the right number to be using when you're, when you're talking about low mass WIMPs, because low mass WIMPs don't respect the nuclear recoil band directly. It turns out, for physics I haven't got time to go into, but just to do with the way the S2 and S1, sorry, the primary and secondary light fluctuations work, we actually get a big boost because they all stack up down here. So that's why our 90% confidence upper limit is so close to the, you know, the Poisson or the Feldman Cousins limit again, for those of you that, that you know, on the lavatory, I can't, you know, brush up on your statistics. So what does it look like in, a, um, um, uh, in one of these exclusion plots? Here's the mass of the WIMP. We don't know it. As Dan described, there are an enormous range of models. I mean, when I started in dark matter, we were at the top of Dan's plot, the one where he literally threw everything in. And we've gone, you know, in logarithmic space, we've gone over half of that guy. I wish we, you know, so, so you could say we've got halfway there. But, you know, there's still a large number of models beneath the sensitivity, which we also need to reach out for. So this blue line is where Lux is. This is the uh, previous best experiment, the Xenon 100. We're over a factor of three better than it in this region uh, here. This was actually when Xenon 100 first switched on. So similar situation to us. They ran for about 100 live days. We ran for whatever it was, 85 days. You know, they went up for a larger number of days and uh, pushed the experiment on. So you can see, you know, with 100 or, you know, 85 live days, we've Actually, we're all the way down here compared to a similar exposure in that detector. That's because that detector is just smaller and has higher backgrounds. Um, this is the expected region, sensitivity, which again is a statistical thing that will excite uh, statisticians. Now, let's take a step back. This is the WIMP plot closer to what Dan showed. So we've still got mass here, but we've now got many more orders of magnitude. This is where all the excitement for low mass WIMPs have been. X marks the spot. That was the uh, CDMS silicon result. This was their most favored region. This is the cogent region. Let's get closer. So this is cogent favored region here. This is CDMS silicon favored region here. This is uh, favored is almost a, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, they, they, they've been showing signal for, for well, since 97 now. Uh, Crest have a, you know, what the clip positive signal. Here is Lux. It's 20 times more sensitive than the previous result. This is 20 times because we've now got many orders of magnitude here. 20 times better means that we are um, uh, able to just, we are simply not consistent with the observations those other experiments have made. We do not see these low mass WIMPs. Okay, so where are we going next? Uh, a 300 day run. That'll get us an extra factor of five in sensitivity. 
Now, one of the things is to note is Lux does not exclude Lux. The first run of Lux does not mean that we won't see anything in the, in the second run of Lux, because we're going to push the sensitivity by such a, 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 a large amount that it's quite possible for there to be WIMPs hiding in our data, or, you know, and that when we run for factor of five, they actually, we get enough new events to actually say, oh, OK, it looks like that previous limit we had was literally on the edge, and that the WIMP model we're looking for is here, and that when we get down to here, actually what happens is we see a signal. And, you know, this is, the, this is the story. I mean, you know, with Lux itself, when we started running, the first day of running Lux eclipsed every previous dark matter experiment I've ever worked on. This is progress. We are, we are continually uh, uh, marching forward in terms of what we're doing. So I wanted to share just at the end here a few statistics with you. Firstly, uh, we, we, it's 12,500 person days. Uh, members of the Lux uh, experiment have already spent uh, you know, here at Sanford Lab, and many more, obviously, in the state. Um, and it's been fantastic. It, we felt very welcome, and it's been a bloody excellent place to work. We've traveled nearly six million miles, uh, sorry, miles, six million feet vertically, which is not to be, uh, not to be sniffed at. <laughs> this one, thanks me. We use internal wikis for exchanging information. We have read over half a million, these things are all monitored these days. We've read over half a million pages. That's like reading War and Peace every day for over a year. <laughs> this one is gonna, if we used USPS, rather than this wonderful ethernet, this electronic thing, if we had used USPS, uh, to, you know, the pistol says, to, to actually physically send all these, these messages that we were doing, we, we have sent over two million point to point as it were, email messages. I, I, I think when well, we started trying to calculate, I think it's well over a thousand uh, postal workers would have been employed underneath this experiment just to keep the messages flowing. Uh, but we realized we really had talks to uh, write at this point and uh, didn't calculate that. So the conclusions, the conclusions. Um, Lux has made a WIMP search run. It's, it's our initial WIMP search run. It has worked extremely well. We ran for 80, sorry, 85 live days. Um, we've released an analysis Today, we, we have made a submission to PRL, which is the most prestigious journal, uh, or one of the most prestigious journals in the physics uh, community. And we've done all this within nine months of first cooling the detector at Davis Lab. I, it, this is unprecedented, and really, as I was saying last night, goes down to just how well the lab and the researchers have all been working together to get through all of the issues that are always associated with doing this kind of work. We have very low backgrounds. We've made major advances in, in calibration, which is why we can be so confident about the result. And for those people looking at the uh, physics paper, which I think has now gone live, yes, um, uh, thing. Uh, and we don't have what you call any ambiguous, uh, ambiguous leakage events. Rather, we see a little bit of leakage, but that's completely statistically what we uh, expect. And the ER rejection has exceeded our stated goal. And in fact, for low mass RIMPs, we, we realize the, the effect of background discrimination is even better than that number might be said to think. As far as intermediate and high mass WIMPs, we're a factor of three better at 35 GeV, the sort of region where, where our minimum comes. We're a factor of two for the really high mass WIMPs, the sort of 1,000 GeV numbers. At low mass WIMPs, the statistics are spectacular. We are 20 times better than any previous experiment. This is why we are, because we don't see anything, we're ruling out those low mass uh, WIMPs. We must give our thanks to the DOE and NSF. They got us rolling, gave us the resources we needed. The governor, the state of South Dakota, Denny Sanford, equally, absolutely instrumental in making this detector as successful. And we now have, as you can see, a world-leading result. It is the best dark matter direct detection result out there right now. Everybody needs, will be talking about it. We also thank Mike and his entire crew here at Sanford Lab for just how fantastic they have been. This is a world-leading lab, and that's what it takes to get a world-leading result. So um, if you want to read the gory details um, on a trip home, sanfordlab.org, uh, although I think we have crashed the website, so you may need to be uh, all the video, uh, too many people, so many people coming in. I, I think uh, maybe our website's crashed as well, I don't know, but Lux Dark Matter, is it still going? Still going. Good, OK. Um, the paper will be available on archive, which is a, which is a preprint server. It has also been submitted to physics review letters. Um, so it's, it, it, you know, this is all part of the scientific process. So we look forward 
to the, the questions, uh, which I hope we're going to have time for. So another point, slightly frivolous. We are now members of Club Sub Zepto. Zepto is, 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 is one of those prefixes that the SI unit system has. I think everybody knows micro, a million micro, obviously. But you go all the way down. You get through nano, pico. Then you get to femto, which some people know. Then you actually get to atto. And then zepto. Zepto. We, Lux, the lab, is now a member of Club Sub Zepto because we are the first experiment to ever get down to cross sections in the Zepto barn range for direct detection. And that is it. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh boy, now I'm in trouble. <laughs>